please, there'll be a blessing to you. I wonder if somebody can say amen. amen. All right, good. I am excited to deliver the word to you today. Um, always honored to stand behind the holy desk, the pulpit. Um, just so you know, this is not a podium. A podium is something that can be used anywhere, anytime for anything. But a pulpit is the place where the word of God is imparted. So even though I know this is a piece of furniture, for what it represents, it represents more. That's why I often say I call it the holy desk, a place where the word of God is imparted to the believers. And so it's an honor, it's a privilege to be able to share the word. It's a, it's a high responsibility as well to stand here, open up the word of God, have somewhere just under 300, 250 to 300 people looking at you. Uh, that can be challenging. If you, if you never tried it, you ought to try it someday. <laughs> Praise God. But uh, I'm, I'm just, I just wanted you to know that I don't take it for granted. Um, it's not a job to me. Uh, I'll preach for the rest of my life. Now, there may become a day, I don't know when, I have no plans that I may retire as a pastor, but I'll never retire as a preacher. I'll preach till the day I die. Amen. Now, I know, you know, uh, one of the coolest ways I suppose to pass away is just to go to bed at night, not wake up in the morning. That'd be the best way, right? And even though I know it'd mess up a lot of people, I just soon preach. Well, I just soon die while preaching, man. That'd be pretty cool. I know it'd be, leave a bad memory in everybody else's mind, though. You know, oh my God, remember the day he was preaching and he killed over, man. <laughs> we had one good brother uh, in our church uh, up north. He actually pastored that church for a number of years. Amazing, amazing man of God. He had had a stroke and uh, survived the stroke, but had a difficult time communicating and so forth and so on. And uh, His wife stepped in and began to be the mouthpiece for him for many years. Just an amazing, amazing couple. And uh, in his later years, they were attending a church down in Saginaw, and they had a special chair for this brother to sit in because, you know, he was still struggling with the disability of stroke. And uh, he... Uh, and he was sitting, what, what? I don't, I don't like it when my wife starts laughing at me from the front. Cause... Would you stop talking about dying, please? Oh, it's all right, baby. And so uh, anyway, he's worshiping, you know, he's worshiping and everything. And then it's all going on. And the next thing you know, he's just kind of, you know, there. And uh, ended up, he died right there in his chair, man. Worshiping God. Now, I know, I thought, whoa, there's a way to go, man. Come on, worshiping the Lord, huh? Come on, somebody. Praise God. You're gonna live long I'm so honored to be able to stand behind the holy desk and bring the word of God to you today. I'm not here to tell you death stories. I don't know where that came from. The title of my message today is Created to Display. Created to Display. In Wichita, Kansas, there's an IMAX theater. It's called the Warren Theater. It, it, it brags having the largest IMAX screen in the United States. It measures 60 feet high and 84 feet wide. But how many know the screen does not exist just to be a screen? Wouldn't it be stupid to pay the price to go in and watch a high-def IMAX uh, show of some kind and just sit and watch the blank screen? That wouldn't make any sense at all, would it? Uh, and it, it exists, why? To display movies, to, ex to display imagery of some kind. Christians do not exist for themselves either. We exist to put the glory of God on display. No, 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 maybe I better say it again. We exist to put the glory of God on display. Amen. Now, if you're visiting with us today and you haven't heard the last four or five sermons in a series, you might be going, well, what's he talking about? Well, obviously I can't preach all four of those preceding. That leads us up to today. 
But they are online available for you to go and to check those out. So I was looking at some scriptures this week. And I found a scripture over in Numbers where it talked about, uh, uh, you know, Moses, potentially the writer uh, of Numbers, uh, that, that, that the glory of the Lord will or shall fill the earth, which was a prophetic word. And then I went over to Isaiah, where Isaiah spoke about the end of time. And he said, and the glory of the Lord filled the earth. And I went, wow, that's pretty cool. So you got the first mention of it. You got the, and I, and I can say the last mention of it because what was actually mentioned in relationship to Isaiah was all the way over in the book of Revelation where that was finally talked about. But then in Habakkuk, it talks about this. Uh, it says, and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord filled the earth. The knowledge of, and I went, whoa, there's a whole new slant, if you will, on the glory of the Lord. As we've been talking about, show me your glory. And then I found another scripture in 2 Corinthians, which ends up being my primary text today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, where it says this, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, all week long, I just kind of milled uh, around those four passages. You know, uh, I started writing a message based on all four. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, no, just this one. As I mentioned in a previous message, we are Intended, created to be prisms through which the glory of God is seen. To a lost and a dying world, they should be able to look at believers of Jesus Christ and see the Lord. That's what they ought to be able to see. See Jesus Christ in us. Why? Because God's spirit lives inside of each and every true believer. We are, if you will, containers of God's anointing. Look at your neighbor. And just say to that person to your right, just look to your right and say, you are a container of God's glory. You see, no longer is the glory of God housed in a box called the Ark of the Covenant. No longer is the glory of God simply housed there in that box in a room called the Holy of Holies. No longer is the glory of God housed in a box called the Ark of the Covenant, kept away, tucked away in a room called the Holy of Holies and, and hidden behind a curtain so thick and so big that it took teams of horses to even potentially pull it apart. Pull it, apart. it was called the veil. No, friends, uh, the glory of God no longer lives in a box, in a room, behind a curtain. The glory of God now lives inside of each and every believer who considers Jesus Christ their Lord and their Savior. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God, your body. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then he is your savior and your Lord. That's important. A lot of people have, have accepted Jesus as redeemer, friend and savior, but have not yet made him Lord of their life. There's a huge, huge chasm between the two. Those who've made Jesus not only their savior, but their Lord have become the temple, the ark, the holy of holies, the veil, if you will. But the veil's gone, praise God. And so you and I are created to display the glory of God. As I said in a message previously, Adam was created and was in the glory of God every single day, walked and talked. And then finally he sinned and it caused a chasm in the coexistence of man and God's glory. And it even says in the book of Psalms that man was crowned with the glory and made a little bit lower, <coughs> excuse me, than God. I know it says angels, but it's the Hebrew word Elohim, which is the name of God. And that now that glory lives inside of us. 
Now, a moment ago, I used the word containers. <clears throat> a container is an object used to hold or transport something. I'll let that sink in for a minute. Think about it. A container is an object that is used to hold or transport something. And herein lies one of the problems. A lot of Christians are holding on to the presence of God and not transporting it. We've become containers with sealed lids and not open vessels to pour out the glory of Jesus Christ that lives on the inside of us. John chapter 7 verse 38 says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I like how it's written in the Message Bible where it says rivers of living water will brim and spill out of the depths of anyone who believes in me. Wow. Friends, when you are brimming, you are full to the point of overflowing. I, honestly, I haven't met a whole lot of brimming Christians. That's all right. I want to start meeting some brimming Christians. People that are overflowing with the glory of God. And remember again that we talked about the glory being found in, in his name, the pro proclamation of his name, where all of his goodness is there. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Horohi, or Jehovah Shama, Jehovah uh, 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 Sidkenu, and, and the rest of them. And those are supposed to be displayed through, guess who? You and me. They're supposed to be displayed. But for whatever reason, I don't know why, there's just sometimes like a faucet drip. And it's not dripping because the faucet handle's turned on a little bit. It's because there's a loose gasket. <laughs> and that's about all that's coming out is drip, drip, drip. And it's supposed to be a rushing river that's flowing out of you and I to others. Right. Yeah. Well, preacher... That's what we pay you to do. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm going to mess with you. What you pay me to do is to show you how to go do it. <laughs> that might not be good because half of you just went, well, we're going to cut you pay. <laughs> the other half went, I think we need to give them a raise. <laughs> no, your vessels, you're supposed to be vessels filled to the brim. I want you to get that imagery for a minute. Filled to the brim. That it only takes a little bit of a jostle. Only a little bit of a nudge. Only a little bit of a shake. And something spills out. Amen? That something comes out. You just need to get bumped a little bit, nudged a little bit, jostled ever so slightly, ever so slightly. And what you're full of will come spilling out. Some of you are full of the wrong stuff. So maybe the question is, what's been spilling out of you? Well, I don't know. Has love been overflowing from your life or when you're bumped, does hate come splashing out? Has joy been spilling out of you or is depression what's seen on the screen of your IMAX theater? Do you display a peace that astounds and confounds those around you or are you known as a worry war? <clears throat> do you act in kindness or do you act in meanness? Are you a fountain of goodness or are you a stagnant pond of wrongdoing? Would you be described as a person of faithfulness or would people say that you're a backbiter and a disloyal betrayer? Is your life marked with gentleness or are you known for aggressive, harsh behavior? <clears throat> when people look at the movie screen of your life, do they see an image of self-control or do they see unbridled, excessive behavior? What, what do people see? <clears throat> when they look at you.
Because they don't just drive up to look at the figurative IMAX screen and have it just be a blank screen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. <coughs> Excuse me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What's supposed to be flowing out of you? All of these things. And in all of these things, you could attribute each one of them to the names of God himself. To the very goodness of the Lord, the unlimited abounding goodness of the Lord. That remember, Moses had to be put into the cave with the hand of the Lord over the cave because he said you can't see all of it. But praise God, we're no longer in a cleft of a rock, but we're standing on the rock of Jesus Christ. There's no longer covered by a veil. The veil has been rent in two. And now the spirit of God himself lives inside of you and me. But there's way too many containers with a label across the front that says Christian with a sealed lid. You and I are created to display the goodness and the glory of God. We're created to display the image of Jesus Christ. You all have heard the phrase, you're working with somebody and you think, you know, I may be the only Jesus they ever see. But are they seeing it? Or are they just seeing a human being who labels themselves Christians who is going through all the same stuff that they're going through and handling it the same way that they're handling it? We're not supposed to be closed containers. We're supposed to be open vessels that are brimming over with the glory and the power of God and spilling out like a rushing river the fruit of the Spirit of God. That's what should be stated of us. That's what should be marked about us. I'm not here as a judge or even to examine you. That is your job, to examine yourself. To look in the proverbial mirror and look there at yourself. <clears throat> and I'll just use Brother Jonathan as an example. Look in the mirror and, and say there to that man looking back at you, what do people see when they see you? Because we all got our weaknesses, right? We all got our shortcomings, right? We all got those certain things that we carry on our sleeve. Yet people are supposed to see something different in us, something different about us. And so again, I ask the question and I believe the question still remains. What's spilling out of you? When you're bumped, what spills out? When somebody takes that parking spot at Walmart or Myers or wherever it may be, does something start to come spilling out and you start putting the lid on and go, no, oh, no, no, not that. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. You get all God-like and want to judge them or something. I know that's what you do. Do you bless them? Think about it. When they take your spot, do you bless them? If the two of you come to the place together, do you prefer them over you and enjoy doing it? Oh, I'm messing with a whole, whole lot of shoppers today. <laughs> well, what's been spilling out? What are people seeing on your IMAX screen? I, I believe that guy just shook his fist at me with a weird finger and he's got a Resurrection Life Church magnet on his truck. <laughs> not good. Disclaimer, that did not happen. <laughs> What's been spilling out of you? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis. We're going to read the whole Bible together this morning. Amen. 
few of you actually woke up right there. <laughs> what, what, what? What do you say, Myrtle? Oh, dear. Chicken's going to be dry. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. Now, remember, our text today was uh, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, right? Uh, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, there's some theological argument, you know, that that was talking about the sun and the moon and the stars, et cetera, et cetera. And, but actually that wasn't done until uh, day four is when he created the sun and the moon and the stars. And when God said, let there be light, what he's actually doing, he's proclaiming the plan of salvation right there in that very moment. He's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, how can you say that, Pastor? Because I know this. My God did not create anything that was void, formless, useless, and dark. It did not say that in the beginning that was the condition of the earth. It said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There's a time before beginning. Scientists have proved that out in the discovery of dinosaurs and all kinds of other things. A time before time, a time before history. But it says the earth was without form and and void, that means completely empty of any usefulness whatsoever. My God does not create things that have zero usefulness. And it was dark. And the reason that it was void and formless and useless and dark is because it was to planet earth that God cast Satan to when he cast Satan out of heaven. And so what you're looking at is a spiritual void, a spiritual uselessness, a, a spiritual darkness that's happening. And God said right then and there, let there be light. Oh, that makes me happy. Hallelujah. That right at the beginning, God says, I'm going to I'm going to give a, a, a hidden prophecy of the plan of salvation in this text. God's plan for the salvation of mankind is written. Jesus is the light that turned an earth that was without form, an earth that was void of use, an earth that was filled with darkness into a place of light. That was our Lord Jesus Christ. And our scripture today from the contemporary English version of the Bible says, the scripture says, God commanded light to shine in darkness. We just read about it in Genesis. Now God <laughs> is shining in our hearts to let you know that his glory is seen in Jesus Christ. Jesus who lives inside of you. It's been said, where's Jesus? Well, we know he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is here on earth, which represents Jesus here on planet earth right now. And he lives in you and me. We're the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are the containers of God's presence, the containers of God's anointing, the containers of God's uh, holy glory. And we're, we're supposed to be brimming over and spilling out and spewing out God's glory and his power and his presence to a, a lost and a hurt hurting in a dying world. Amen. Friends, the light is shining in our hearts. That's happening because you and I are vessels of God's glory. We're vessels of the presence of the Lord. Think about it. We come to church expecting the presence to be here because God is everywhere. We understand that. But there's something amazing that happens when a group of believers come together. Huh? Because the anointing, the presence that's in them seems to combine and phenomenal, amazing, wonderful events take place in the assembly of believers at church that just doesn't happen most often in other places. 
I'm afraid that what's happening for a lot of us, that's what's flowing out of us is not a river of living water, but is a sullied river that needs to be cleaned up. Needs to be cleaned up. I was, when I wrote this part of my message, I immediately thought about the skimmer basket on my swimming pool. And every day I have to go out there and reach in there and pull that skimmer basket out. It's full of bugs, flies, and leaves, and junk. And I got to clean all that out. And all that water then is ran through a sand filter and anything that gets past the skimmer goes through another skimmer. And if it gets past that skimmer, it goes into the sand and it all combines right there, this, this pollution of the swimming pool. And it's filtered out through the sand. But eventually, the, it, what can happen if the pool's not taken care of and the skimmer's not cleaned out, the, the pool can get sullied. It can get cloudy. It can turn green. It's no longer... You know, it's, it, they say it's okay to swim in, but who would want to? My toilet water's cleaner. I've never been swimming in my toilet. But you got to do something to treat it. You got to get the water cleaned up. And it doesn't take much at all for just a little bit of chemical to be put in there. And all of a sudden it's pristine, clear again, but it takes some care. And for us, there's so much of life that has been filtering through our systems and we're not getting uh, into the presence of God enough to have the figurative skimmer basket of our life cleaned out and get the bugs and, and the leaves and the stuff out and it's all filtering through us. And there's a thing that has to happen with the sand filter every once in a while when the water turns cloudy, you gotta do a thing called a backwash. You backwash all the water out of it, out into a storm drain, and it gets all the impurities out. There's a whole lot of us need a little backwash in. All right, I'll close. Well, when people look at our life, what do they see? What's spilling out of you? Cloudy water? Impure water? Is a river of living water not just trickling from you because you have a bad gasket? Is a river of living water gushing from you because you're so filled with God's presence that you're running over, you're spilling out? Someone just bumps into you, you know, pulls into your parking spot, just bumps into you, and instead of nasty things pouring out of you, God's goodness pours out of you? I'm reading more than one person's mail this morning. So I started this message with an illustration of the IMAX theater screen. As I said, it would be foolish to pay to sit and watch the blank screen for 90 minutes. The screen has a purpose, and it's to display amazing video imagery. And likewise, it, it's foolish to call yourself a Christian, but all that is seen when people look at the screen of your life is a blank screen or a cloudy pool. You see, you have a purpose, and it's to display the amazing imagery of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus. When people see you, they're supposed to see the amazing imagery of Jesus Christ in everything that he is. I know we are imperfect. I understand that. But we're still filled with God's presence and his spirit. And we are the temple of the Lord. And what's supposed to be coming out of us is a river of living water. In the book called ABCs of Bible Prayer, there's a poem that's called God's Nail. Now, I've only shared one line of that poem with you before, but I want to share the whole poem with you this morning. It'll be on the screen. It says, Lord, make me a nail upon the wall, fastened securely in its place. Then from this thing so common and so small, hang a bright picture of thy face that travelers may pause to look upon the loveliness depicted there 
and passing on their weary ways, each radiant face may bear, stamped so that nothing can efface the image of thy glory and thy grace. Let, Lord, let not one soul think of me, only let me be the nail upon the wall holding that picture in its place. What do people see when they look at you? This really is a culmination, if you will, or it, it certainly a continuation of the Show Me Your Glory series that we've been in. Because I spoke to you last week about how you are created to be vessels of the glory of God. And here today I'm asking you, what are people seeing? Are they seeing a rushing river or a cloudy pool? Are they seeing a figurative, metaphoric IMAX screen with amazing imagery or a blank screen when they look at your life? What's spilling out of you? I'm not here to examine you or answer that question for you. Each of you have to answer that question yourself. But I'll guarantee that more than likely, all of you have been going, whoa, I got some work to do. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a minute? Because I want to give you an invitation to receive Jesus Christ. I want to give you an invitation to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you an invitation to begin to square some of this away in your life, to get it fixed. If the thoughts and the words and the deeds of your life this past week were to be shown on an IMAX screen, would you be okay with that? Or would you shrink down in your seat hoping that no one could identify you? Are you okay with what's been seen? <clears throat> Have you been saying no to the invitation to accept Christ for so long that you've just become a little bit hardened? Have you gotten to the place where your conscience just doesn't care anymore? Then you need Jesus. You see, none of us knows what tomorrow holds. We have no clue how long this life will last. Some of us may think that we're forever young and immortal, but the Bible says that it's appointed unto everyone to die. Not a, not a fun part of it, no. And, and if you stepped out of this life today, would you be ready to stand before God? I mean, really, I want you to look at yourself right now. If you stepped out of this life today, would you be ready to stand before God? See, today is the day of salvation. The season of standing on the fence is over, friends. We're in the end times. We're in the days just before the return of the Lord. And this is not a time to be proclaiming to be one thing and living like another. It's time to make a decision. There's an old story written in the history books and one that reveals the tragedy of the Konamal Valley and the Konamal Dam. The engineers were sent to the valley and they checked the dam and, and they said it was gonna break. They pointed out certain weaknesses in the dam that, that made it unsafe. And after their investigation, they, they rode down the valley. This was in the late 1800s as this took place. And they began to warn the people and they began to say, move out, get on higher ground, get rid of everything and get away from the danger. But the people didn't he heed the warning. The engineers went away and the people remained. The engineers returned a second time and they checked the dam again and then they warned the people again, urging them to move before the dam broke and the entire valley was flooded. This time the folks actually laughed at them and they said, you're here a short time ago and nothing has happened so everything's just fine. And again, the engineers went on their way knowing that they had done their best. Then a third year they came and it was in the spring of the year and this time their, or, their warning was even more urgent and they told every man, every woman, every child, everyone, you must get out at once, you must move out of here, you must get to a higher place, you must get to a safer place. And again, the people scorned the warning and just said, you just wanna get our land because it's rich and it's good and we're not going to move. So the engineers, they rode out of the valley 
15 days later, there came a man riding a horse, just like in the olden days, and he was crying as he rode, the waters are coming, the dam is breaking, the waters are coming. And he kept on shouting and screaming and crying, and still they tell us some people stood and laughed. He was not out of their sight before they could hear the sound of the waters because the Konamal Dam had broken and in just a matter of a few minutes, 3,300 people lost their lives. It took over six weeks to dig their bodies out of the refuse, the muck, and the mire. What I want you to hear is they had been warned, not once, not twice, but three times even as I'm seeking to warn you today to run to Jesus Christ, to repent and to believe in Him and to receive Him as your Savior. Christ is available to all of those who will simply come to Him. If you'll just come to Him in repentance, if you'll just come to Him in faith, if you'll just come receiving Him, He'll give you everlasting life. And so while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm going to offer you that invitation to come and to heed the warning. And you might say, well, pastor, what's the warning today? Well, let's look at it in a couple of different ways. Number one, you've never accepted Jesus Christ. You don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you die, you're going to hell. I know that's not what you want to hear, but it's true. So I'm offering you an invitation to accept Jesus into your life today. Well, what's the second part? Well, the second part is maybe you are a Christian and you love Jesus and, 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 and you've accepted him, but you've strayed away from him. You're not living for him anymore. And I'm offering you a warning today. Don't be caught at the sound of the trumpet with your lamp empty. Well, what's what's the third part, Pastor? Well, there's some of you that's just been a container with a lid on it. And you haven't been, oh, you've been overflowing, but you've been overflowing with all the wrong stuff. And you recognize today that you need to change that. You need to get that fixed. And so there's your third warning. I wonder, will you heed that warning? So I'm standing here on the floor and I'm just asking you, to come if either one of those three warnings spoke to you move from your seat and come stand here with me today God bless you just come stand right here anybody else God bless you yep anybody else want to join these two God bless you sir God bless you ma'am Just line up along here. Come stand right over here. Who else? I don't need to repeat the altar call. You've heard it, but I want you to receive it today as a warning. The Lord is coming. Anyone else? You got something you can sing? Go for it. Your will above all else and my purpose remains. The art of losing myself and bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise Become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Mm-hmm. You will above all else, my purpose. 
purpose remains the art of losing myself and bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all hell's face never ending your glory goes beyond all fame oh my heart and my soul i give you control consume me from the inside out lord let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out and everlasting your light will shine with all else face and never ending your glory goes beyond all fame and a cry of my heart to bring you praise from the inside out. Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame and a cry. Is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord of my soul. Cries out from the inside out, Lord my soul. Cries from the inside out, Lord my soul. Cries out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else face never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to sing you praise from the end. Sigh out, Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else face never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you pray from the end side out lord my soul cries out mm -hmm, yeah. from the end side it out mm -hmm. my soul I give you control consume me from the inside out Lord let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out From the inside out, deep crying out to deep. Oh, from the inside out, oh, 
my soul cries out to you, Lord. Ooh, yeah. My soul cries out. Every single person that came up said the wrong things have been spilling out of me. One person said, I want to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. Amen. But, but even that person says the wrong things are spilling out of me. And I, I'm just, uh, probably all of us should have been in that prayer line about the wrong things spilling out of you. But I, I want you to know I'll be praying for you this week. That when you're jostled or when you're bumped, that Jesus Christ comes spilling out of you. Those fruit of the Spirit come spilling out of you. Instead of anger... Instead of a bad mouth, instead of whatever it else, whatever else it is that you may be dealing with, may love and joy and peace and long suffering and patience and goodness and gentleness and kindness come spilling out of you and faithfulness come spilling out of you. Can you say amen? amen. If you've been blessed this morning.